Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. We have the uh, special pleasure of having um, Dr. John Go from uh, USC School of Medicine um, giving us a lecture, which I have previously heard uh, in the International Temporal Bone Course. Uh, John's the director of head and neck imaging at uh, Keck USC School of Medicine and also at the House Ear Clinic, Los Angeles. So it's with great pleasure that um, it's with great pleasure today that I introduce him, and I think that you will get a, quite a bit of really helpful and um, useful information out of this. So, John, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Richard, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, my topic today is uh, CT and MR imaging of the temporal bone. Uh, I'm at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, California, here in the United States. And so um, our objectives um, are, to, I'm gonna describe basically the basic technique of imaging the temporal bone utilizing multi-slice CT and MRI. And then we're gonna go over the anatomy of the temporal bone using both CT and predominantly CT <laughs> and with our um, so basically imaging the temporal bone at this point with multi-slice CT as a piece of cake, you're going to obtain a biometric data set. Um, depending on your scanner, it may, the slice thickness may range from 0.4 to 1.25 millimeters. And if the slice thickness is over a millimeter, you may, it may require a 50% overlap. But once you achieve one millimeter or less in terms of the slice thickness, you can basically do a reconstruction like you would like um, a loaf of bread. Now you wanna film this in a bone algorithm. The head is typically in a neutral position. From the axial images, you can get coronal and sagittal images as well. And typically when you're looking at a temporal bone study, you'll wanna have all three axial, coronal and sagittal images up at the same time so that you can cross-reference to see whether or not a finding that you actually visualize is actually real or not. And if you need to, you can do uh, additional multiplanar reformat views, and I'll go over some of those um, in a little while. Now, obviously, if you are looking at images at 0.5 millimeters, the data set is huge. We're talking about data sets uh, between four to 800 images. And so if, for example, for hard copy images, or even for your PAX system, if you were to film at one millimeter images, that should be sufficient to be able to see the acyclic chain in continuity if you were to scroll through the data set. Anything larger than a millimeter, um, you're gonna have gaps and you're gonna miss uh, things like subtle, like for example, acicular uh, erosions or disruptions. And so you wanna see it, the slice thickness should never be more than a millimeter when you're looking at the studies. Here's an example. Uh, these images were acquired in the axial plane and uh, notice that in the coronal and sagittal reconstructions, there are no stair-step artifacts. It, it looks as if the patient were scanned in the sagittal or coronal plane, but these are reconstructed um, images from the axial data set. Now for MRI imaging of the temporal bone, it's different from MRI of the brain. Uh, to image the temporal bone, you have to do thinner slices. Typically a brain MRI slices are five millimeters inner slice gap is two. So typically the slices are seven millimeters in terms of the thickness. Well, in the temporal bone, we typically scan three millimeters or less. Normally the T1 and the T2 weighted images, for example, three millimeters with zero gap. Um, you should not use uh, fat suppression techniques on your pre-contrast T1 weighted images. You can use the fat soft tissue interface to be able to see lesions better. Though when you do contrast images, those should be done with fat suppression. Um, we also typically do a thin section T2 weight image. It's called um, uh, Fiesta on a GE magnet, KISS on a Siemens magnet, phase imaging on, Philip, on a Toshiba magnet, for example. These are thin, heavily T2 weight images um, that are fluid sensitive. So fluid is really bright and you get what we call a myelographic effect if you were, as if you were to do a cisternogram. So you get a nice contrast between the high signal intensity of the fluid in the subarachnoid space and the structures that sit uh, within subarachnoid space. And we normally do diffusion imaging as part of our uh, temporal bone protocol. There are different ways to do diffusion. If you do an EPI diffusion sequence, which is how you would normally do um, diffusion imaging for a brain MRI, again, the slices are really too thick, they're big, and there's a lot of problems with susceptibility problems. 
Uh, newer techniques include propeller diffusion or a non EPI haste imaging, and those are uh, typically used to look for cholesteatoma. Here's an example of an MRI uh, here as a whole brain MRI. You can see T1 weighted axial images, and these are chunky slices. And the reason is because these are five millimeters with two millimeter gap. So this is a thinner section, uh, temporal bound protocol, where you can actually see these are three millimeter slices. You can see the ICCP angle is better in this patient with NF2. You see multiple masses in the ICCP angle. There's a small intracochlear lesion on the right side. That intracochlear lesion probably could not be seen on the whole brain MRI. So, you know, you really should do dedicated temporal bone protocols if you're going to be looking um, for lesions in the ICCP angle or uh, intratemporal in location. So, here's a basically a protocol where you see. Um, uh, Pre-contrast T1 weighted image. This is a post-contrast T1 weighted image without fat sat. This is with fat sat. Um, this is a T2 weighted image and a T2 and a T1 post-coronal. And again, you should always do your pre-contrast T1 weighted images in your temporal bone protocol without fat suppression, and your post-contrast images should be done with fat suppression. And again, as I mentioned, the diffusion sequences. Um, diffusion should be, um, there are different ways to do diffusion, EPI, propeller EPI, or non-EPI diffusion. This probably has a highest sensitivity and specificity when looking for small lesions like a cholesteatoma. So if you have the capability of doing a non-EPI diffusion, it's called like haste diffusion imaging, uh, and that's uh, on a Siemens system, uh, you should do that. Um, the thin section T2 weighted images, this is a KISS or Fiesta sequence. These are heavily T2 weighted images. These are submillimeter images. Um, the, the effect of slice thickness uh, when you do these high resolution T2 weighted fluid sensitive sequences are usually in a range of uh, 0 0.7 millimeters, which is great. And notice that these are fluid sensitive, so the fluid is really bright. And so you can see the structures, for example, running in the CP angle cistern, IAC how well you can see the synaptic nerve complex. Here, for example, you can see the sixth nerve going at the pontomedullary junction and crossing the uh, prepontine cistern. Uh, so this is a really wonderful sequence to look at structures within the subarachnoid space, vascular loops. You can see very small nerve sheet tumors as filling defects, but realize that these are heavily T2-weight images, and so you get no T2 information from the sequence. So you cannot talk about signal intensity of a lesion, for example, on the KISS or Fiesta sequence because um, they're heavily T2 weighted and you get no T2 information from those sequences. And, you know, because they're thin sections, then we can do is you can do multiplanar reformats from that Actio data set, for example, and you can see the subnate nerve complex crossing the CP angle cistern and entering the porous acoustic and IC. So you can see, again, uh, great to look for whether or not you might have cochlear nerve agenesis or a vascular loop compression syndrome, it's a great sequence to use. This is just a, um, a coronal oblique through the IC and how we can see all four nerves within the IC. This is um, anterior, posterior, superior, and inferior. And you can see all four nerves within the IC. Here's a facial nerve, facial nerves, uh, anterior, superior, seven up. Cochlear nerve is inferior, inferiorly. Here's a cochlear nerve and then a superior infravestibular nerve. So this heavily, you know, this T2-weighted image, heavily T2-weighted image, fluid sensitive sequence, then some millimeter images. You can see how well you can see the structures within the subarachnoid So here's the protocol um, for uh, MRI, the temporal bone. Um, you want to do a spin echo T1-weighted image, three millimeters, zero gap, matrix size is 256 by 256. Uh, you'll want to do a fast spin echo T2 weighted image or flare image of the whole brain to, so that you can look at the auditory pathway. If there could be a central cause, for example, of hearing loss. If you want to look at Heschel's gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus, for example. So you want a whole brain um, T2 weighted or a T2 flare sequence. And then um, the post conscious images, thin section, T1 weighted, axial and coronal with fat suppression. Again, thin section, three millimeters or less. Uh, a diffusion sequence, non-TPI diffusion or propeller diffusion, and this thin section T2 weighted fluid sensitive sequence with this uh, KISS or Fiesta. It goes by different names depending on the MR manufacturer, but they all have this thin section T2 weighted submillimeter imaging. 
Okay, so that was basically the protocol for temporal bone, how to image. And we're gonna spend the rest of the time on is we're gonna go over the anatomy now of the temporal bone, primar primarily using CT since it's primarily bony anatomy that we're gonna be looking at and maybe some MR images. So first let's talk about the temporal bone. Uh, for my own students, they always feel um, uh, daunted when it comes to temporal bone anatomy. And I don't know why, because the, the sphenoid bone is a more complex bone than the temporal bone. Um, and and um, most of the neural foramen run through the sphenoid bone. So the sphenoid bone actually has more anatomy in it than the temporal bone does. And one of the beauties of uh, understanding temporal bone anatomy, especially when you start talking about some of the smaller structures is that they are constant structures. There's no variability. And if there's any type of variability, then it's considered an abnormality. So once you know the anatomy, it's pretty much pretty rigid uh, to understand that. So let's talk about the temporal bone first and generality first. And there are basically four or five components to the temporal bone, depending on your anatomy textbooks. There's a squamosal portion, that's the flat bone, um, that uh, you can see it articulates with, um, you know, with the frontal, the parietal bone, the occipital bone, that's the flat component. And then uh, the tympanic portion of the temporal bone, which forms most of the external auditory canal, the bony EAC. Uh, the pedris component is where basically most of the goodies are. Um, it's triangular in appearance and the mastoid is really part of the petrous temporal bone and it's not really considered a separate component of the temporal bone. So petrous should encompass the mastoid portion. So the fourth portion should be, is the styloid process itself, um, extending uh, inferiorly. This is just an internal view and these images were created from a CT of the temporal bone and these are 3D renderings and looking at the bones themselves and just, just looking internally from the inside. Here's the frame and magnum. Here's the petrous pyramid. This is the, the um, porous acousticus um, petrous pyramid, the highest point of the, oh, see, here's the porous acousticus of the IAC. The highest point of the petrous pyramid, as you know, if you're ENT surgeons, is the arcuate eminence, which is where the superior semicircle canal actually is situated. So let's start with the anatomy first. Um, we're gonna go from the outside and work our way in. Uh, so we're gonna start with the external auditory canal and the external auditory canal itself. Um, has a cartilage and a bony EAC. The outer one half to two thirds is cartilaginous. the inner segment is bony. Um, and so the, the tympanic portion of the temporal bone is one of the parts of the temporal bone. Anatomically, there's an anterior and posterior tympanic spine and floor. This is a U-shaped bone in the self of the tympanic part of the temporal bone. And where it articulates anteriorly with the petrous component, there's a fissure called the petrotympanic or glycerian fissure. And uh, where the posterior tympanic spine uh, meets the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, this is um, the tympano, um, this is a tympanomastoid suture between the tympanic and the mastoid part of the temporal bone. So petrotympanic anteriorly, tympanomastoid posteriorly. From the petrotympanic fissure, as you go uh, laterally to the surface of the temporal bone to the squamosal portion, it becomes the tympanosquamosal suture. Now the petrotympanic fissure, which is between the intertympanic spine and the petrous temporal bone, also called a glycerian fissure, two structures actually run through this fissure. The intertympanic artery, which is a branch of the ascending pharyngeal, extends posteriorly to the medial cavity, but also uh, the corda tympani nerve um, traverses the middle ear cavity and exits through the glycerian fissure, fissure as well. So, Again, as I mentioned, the uh, external auditory canal is cartilaginous, the outer half or two thirds. Uh, the inner um, third or half of the EAC is bony. Um, there is a natural wasting of the bony EAC. This is called the isthmus of the external, of the bony external auditory canal and subdivides the bony EAC into a medial and lateral component. And the isthmus is the narrowest portion of the bony EAC. Remember that this is all lined by squamous epithelium. Uh, you do have specialized glands that actually are, are on the surface here. Um, these are the cerumen glands that form the cerumen or wax. And so when you're thinking about a differential diagnosis for tumors in this location, think about that because uh, these are not, this is not a mucosal surface. These are skin elements. And so obviously uh, lesions that involve the external auditory canal would be lesions that would involve skin. So for example, tumors like um, squamous cell cancer, melanoma, basal cell cancer, tumors that arise from the struminous glands, like an adenoma or, or um, 
uh, adenocarcinoma, for example, that arise from the strumen glands, and you can have bony lesions arriving from the bony EAC. Okay, and this is just an MR looking at the same thing. This is a T1 weighted sagittal image. Uh, remember, here's, here's a condylar head, and the poster wall of the condylar fossa is the anterior wall of the EAC. Now, obviously, you know, how well can you see the external artery canal? Not well, and the reason is because if it's aerated, it's air, and air has susceptibility to artifact. But here you can see the cartilage and the soft tissue forming that uh, external artery canal, and this is the EAC itself with air within it. And anatomically, you know that this is the intertympanic spine because the intertympanic, the interwall of the EAC is the poster wall of the condylar fossa here. Um, this is just um, on MR, um, on a T1 weighted image here, you can see um, the air within the e external artery canal. This is the um, skin elements here forming the walls of the EAC itself. So let's talk about the tympanic membrane now because that's gonna divide the middle ear cavity from the external artery canal. If you're looking at this otoscopically, it's oval in shape, it's taller, it's taller than it is wide. So in the cranial caudal measurement, it's 12 millimeters. In the AP measurement, it's 10. So it's oval in shape. If you're looking directly at the tympanic membrane um, between the 10 and two o'clock position is the pars, the pars blaster component of the tympanic membrane and the rest is the pars tensor portion. The pars blaster component is slightly thicker than the pars tensor portion. So if you're gonna be able to see this on CT, the pars blaster portion should be a little thicker. And this is held in place by an annulus. This is the, the tympanic annulus. Now on a CT, um, this, is, this actually came from a paper by Jaeger in 2005 saying, oh, look how you can see that this is the tympanic membrane here on axial images. And notice that the anterior aspect of the tympanic annulus, the intertympanic annulus is more medial than the posterior tympanic annulus. Uh, and for example, the superior tympanic annulus is more lateral than the inferior tympanic annulus. But, you know, this is, this is not what the TM actually looks like. This is what it really looks like when you do a CAT scan. You can barely see it. It's such a thin structure. Normally the only component of the TM that you can actually see if you're gonna be able to see it at all is the pars, the pars blaster component, which is slightly thicker. So that means that if you have a TM perforation, uh, you will not be able to identify perforations on CT or MR because the TM is just too thin. And so we would have to just know ahead of time that the patient has a perforation. On the other hand, if there's thickening of the tympanic membrane, such as in moringo sclerosis, um, um, and we see it very well, then we know that it's, it's going to be abnormal because normally we can't see the tympanic membrane. So we can see the TM very well, we'll usually call it abnormal and call it moringo sclerosis. Okay, so let's now move on into the uh, middle ear cavity itself. And so the first thing we're going to do, and this is, uh, it's called the middle ear cavity or middle ear cleft. It's bored by the TM laterally and the inner ear immediately. And so we're, what, we're, what we're going to do first is we're going to treat the middle ear cavity, which is a space, as a box. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the walls of the box. So let's talk about the lateral border of the middle ear cavity first. And remember, this is the space between the TM laterally and the inner ear medially, this, and it's also called the middle ear cleft. So the lateral border of the middle ear cavity, the superior half is formed by a projection from the petrous temporal bone. This is called the sputum. And the tip of the sputum, it's sharply angulated, it ends at a point, and the tip of the sputum is where the superior tympanic annulus is for the tympanic membrane. And the inferior half of the middle ear cavity is formed by the tympanic membrane itself. So superior half is the sputum coming from the petrous temporal bone, and the inferior half is formed by the tympanic membrane itself. The superior border of the middle ear cavity is formed by this, basically it's the roof, it's from the petrous temporal bone, and this is called the tegmen tympani. It's the roof of the middle ear cavity. It may or may not be aerated. You may have air cells with it. In this case, there are air cells here, which extension of mastery air cells into the, uh, the tegmen tympani. It may just be solid bone, but there should be um, a roof to the middle ear cavity. Now, the medial border is formed um, by. Let me see. I'm trying to like uh, move this. 
is going to be formed by the bone that covers the lateral semicircular canal, as well as the bone that forms the cochlear promontory. So here's the medial border of the medial ear cavity, two pair half. This is the lateral semicircular canal. So the bone that forms the lateral semicircular canal is the two pair half. The infer half is the bone that forms the basal turn of the cochlea called the cochlear promontory. And one of the nice things about knowing this anatomy is that if you follow the cochlear promontory up, it will point you directly to the oval window, which is where the stapes actually sits. Now, the um, inferior border is formed by bone that is, separates the cried artery and jugular vein um, from the uh, middle ear cavity. So at the level of the carotid, um, this would be the carotid plate. And at the, let me see if we can go back for a second. Uh, here we go. Okay. And um, so at the level of the carotid, this is a carotid, at the level of the cochlea on a coronal image, this should be the carotid, this should be the carotid artery. And the, and the carotid plate separates the carotid artery from the middle of your cavity. And at the level of the jugular vein, this is the jugular vein, this is the jugular plate. Uh, at the level of the vestibule on a coronal image. So CC, carotid, cochlea, VV, vestibule, vein. That's a way to remember this. And that the vein is posterior to the artery there. And, um, okay. And anteriorly, um, these are air cells, they're tegment air cells that separate, um, that form the anterior border. So the last border we need to talk about, these are the borders of the middle cavity, is the posterior border of the middle cavity. And I like to think of this uh, as a hill between two valleys. Uh, the hill is the pyramidal eminence. And from the pyramidal eminence is the stapedius muscle, originates from the pyramidal eminence. And this is the hill between two valleys. So there's a valley immediately. This is called the sinus tympani. And then you're at the level of the basal turn of the cochlea. So this is the sinus tympani here. And laterally is the facial recess and directly behind the facial recess is the vertical segment of the facial nerve. So this is a hill between two valleys, facial recess laterally, sinus tympani medially um, there. And the stapedius muscle is situated uh, arising from the primal eminence. Okay, now that we have defined the middle ear cavity by its borders, now we're gonna compartmentalize the middle ear cavity. And we can think of these as a series of spaces. So what I'm gonna do is if you, on a chrome image, we draw two lines through the roof and floor of the EAC and where it intersects the airway, it divides the middle ear cavity into three different spaces. Central compartment is the mesotympanum. Superiorly, this is called the epitympanum. Inferiorly, this is called the hypotympanum. And you can see the structures that are situated in the epitympanum. For example, the malleus head, body and process of the incus sit in the epitympanum. In the mesotympanum, it's the rest of the incus, long and of the incus, and the steepy superstructure sit in the mesotympanum. But this, these are three spaces that we just defined just by drawing a line along the roof and the floor of the EAC and where it intersects the airway. Now, if you take an axial image and draw two more lines, this divides the middle ear cavity into three spaces again. Central space is again the mesotympanum, but the space anterior would be the protympanum, posteriorly would be the posttympanum. So at this point now, we have now subdivided the middle ear cavity into a series of spaces, and basically there are five spaces. The central compartment is the mesotympanum, superiorly it's epitympanum, inferiorly it's hypotympanum, anteriorly it's protympanum, posteriorly it's posttympanum. So now you can be very descriptive when you're trying to describe a lesion in the middle ear cavity. For example, it's a meso and epitympanic mass. It's a mass in the posttympanum. It's a lesion in the protympanum. This is a hypotympanic lesion. Okay, now that we've defined the borders and we've defined the spaces, now we're gonna talk about the contents of the middle ear cavity. The first thing we're gonna review is the ossicular chain. And so let's talk about the ossicles. There are three, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus is the most interior of the ossicles. And this is from Gray's anatomy. This is uh, what the anatomy of the malleus looks like. There's a head to the malleus. This articulates with the incus. There's a very short neck. There are three processes. Um, there is a long process, an anterior and a lateral process. The long process is also called the manubrium, which is embedded in the tympanic membrane. The anterior and lateral processes you usually do not see. And the reason is because these serve as attachment points for ligaments. 
Um, now, and they may become relevant if you have calcification or ossifications of the ligaments, which could cause ossicular fixation. So just be aware that there are three processes to the malleus. There's the long process called the manubrium, which is embedded in the tympanic membrane, but you also have an anterior and a lateral process, and these, again, serve as attachment points for ligaments. Now, on a sagittal image, when you're looking at the malleus and the incus here, notice that it, it almost looks like a molar tooth, doesn't it? This looks like a tooth, like the, here's the crown of the tooth. These are the roots of the teeth. This actually is the malleus anteriorly. This is the incus posteriorly, and this is called the molar tooth sign of the malleus and incus. Now, what you can do if you wanted to on the sagittal plane is that you could do a reformatted image along the axis of the malleus, and that allows you to see the entire malleus here. So there's the malleus head, neck, and the manubrium on one cut. Here you can see the relationship of the malleus. It is the most anterior ossicle. The malleus is the ice cream of what we call the ice cream, ice cream cone configuration of the malleus and the body short process of the incus here. This is the mallow incadal joint. Um, so here's the malleus head, and you go one slice inferiorly, that would be the manubrium there. Now let's talk about the incus, the second ossicle. Uh, it has four parts to it. And this is again a picture from Gray's Anatomy. This is the body of the incus. This is the fossa for the malleus head. This is the short process, the body in the short process, which protects posteriorly. This would be the ice cream cone component. But notice that from the body inferiorly is the long process and the, uh, the um, Incus then turns medially, and this is called the lenticular process. And this terminal part of the incus articulates with the capitulum of the stapes. So uh, here you can see that ice cream, ice cream cone configuration of the malleus head and body short process of incus. This is at the level of the epitempidum. So body and short process of the incus. And as you go inferiorly, we can see the long and lenticular process of the incus. Here's the incus stapedial joint and the stapes capitellum which is the handle of the stapes. Um, so that lenticular process returns on 90 degrees is what articulates with the medial incus. Is somebody drawing on here? Yeah, somebody is. Um, I don't know how that's going. I don't know how they were able to do that. I don't know. Um, I don't know how to take it off. I don't either. <laughs> I've seen that before. Anyway, John, just keep going. Whoever's writing, would you please stop? Thank you. Or if you could erase that, that'd be great. So this is just to show you um, here um, that terminal part of the incus. Uh, this is the capitone of the state beast here. Uh, reason I'm showing you these two cuts, these are, this is on an axial, this is on a sagittal. And you could do a double multiplayer reformatted view where you align um, a chronal oblique with the axis of the long lenticular process of the incus, state beast, and oval window, and readjust the plane for the long axis of the incus. And what that allows you is a double multi double multiplanar reformatted view is that it allows you to see the rest of the incus in its continuity. So here's a body of the incus, the long process where it turns 90 degrees at the lenticular process of the incus. And this is a good plane to use if you're trying to determine whether or not you might actually have ossicular erosion or disruption uh, where you see discontinuity or an air gap. Um, and again, that on sagittal images, that's the classic molar tooth configuration of the malleus and incus. This is the mount incadal joint and the malleus head body of incus. That's the crown of the tooth. The roots of the teeth anteriorly is the manubrium of the malleus. Posteriorly is the long process of the incus. Uh, the last ossicle is the stapes. Um, um, it uh, basically does look like a, an anvil with a handle. Um, this is the cap capitulum of the stapes. This articulates with the lenticular process of the incus. Uh, there's an anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes, and then the foot plate sits on the oval window. Um, this is these images. Uh, you know, you can see the incus of the stapes here. This is the anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes. This is the foot plate of the stapes sitting on the oval window. Um, it's slightly tilted. The, medial, the lateral part of the uh, stapes is slightly tilted inferiorly. That's why you may not see it all in one slice. So you may see it on two slices. Uh, but here you can see again the anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes and the um, cap capitulum of the stapes itself. Uh, this shows you the relationship of the ossicles, the malleus, head, neck, and manubrium, malincadal joint, 
the body long and the ticker process the incus incus the stapedial joint and the stapy superstructure and this is showing you just some of the ligaments here because this becomes relevant when we start talking if you talked about ossicular fixation that can be caused for conductive hearing loss where you have calcification or ossification of uh, of the ligaments that could cause fixation and so Remember that there's an anterior lateral process for the malleus. There's also a superior ligament for the malleus head. The short process, there's a ligament connecting that to the fossa incudus uh, posteriorly. You do have the two joints, the mount incudo and the incudus tapio joint. The incudus tapio joint is the weaker of the two joints. And the annular ligament holds the foot plate of the state beast in place at the level of the oval window. And um, let's see. I think we're going to bypass this slice and pass that. So we've reviewed the ossicles now. Um, there are a few more things we're going to talk about. And one is a few more recesses and spaces uh, of the middle ear cavity. First, at the level of the epitepidum, which is the superior portion of the middle ear cavity, it is in direct communication with the mastoid antrum. The mastoid antrum is the largest of the mastoid air cells and it's the central air cell. And so, you know, Fluid debris from the mastoids converge and drain to the mastoid antrum. And then notice on this axial image, it goes to the small channel. This is called the additus ad antrum or window to the antrum that communicates directly with the epitempanum, which is the superior compartment we talked about earlier. So, and just inferior to that, you can see it goes, it communicates directly to your cavity. So it has this classic hourglass configuration of the mastoid antrum, the additus ad antrum, and the epitympanum. Now, there is a recess in the epitympanum. Um, this is called the epitympanic or supertubal recess. It's an air cell. It's a space, a part of the epitympanum, separated from the rest of the epitympanum by this very thin shell of bone, which is called the cog of the epitympanic recess. But look at the relationship of this epitympanic recess to the facial canal. This is the facial canal here. Uh, this is the distal lab, geniculate proximal tympanic segment of the facial nerve. If you have pathology in the epitympanic recess, for example, like inflammation, a clesiotoma, you can in theory uh, cause erosion of the facial canal and a patient could have a facial paralysis. So realize that this is a special air, this is a special recess called the epitympanic or supertubal recess. And it's relevant because of its relationship to the facial canal. Uh, another space to talk about in, in the hypotip is the eustachian tube. So middle ear cavity drains into the eustachian tube, also equalizes pressure here. Notice that the, um, the opening for the eustachian tube uh, is in the anterior aspect of the hypotympanum, and one against the inferior space, and uh, extends inferiorly to the um, nasopharynx. So uh, notice the relationship of the eustachian tube to the posterior genu of the petrous internal carotid artery. Uh, this is a carotid plate separating the eustachian tube opening from the, um, from the carotid itself. And so you, you can see why surgery in the middle of cavity in the region of the eustachian tube orifice can be dangerous because if you were to fracture the carotid plate, you could actually injure the petrous, the petrous segment of the internal carotid artery. Okay. We have two muscles in the middle of your cavity. We have the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle. We talked about the stapedius muscle earlier. This is the muscle that arises from the pyramidal eminence. Uh, the fibers extend anteriorly to attach either to the capitalum of the stapes or the posterior crus. This is innervated by seven. The fifth nerve is a uh, innervates the tensor tympani muscle. Uh, fibers of the tympani muscle. Arise from the medial aspect of the proximal yeah. eustachian yeah. tube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can someone mute that? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I got it. Uh, okay. So the tensor tympani muscle itself originates from the eustachian tube itself, medially extends posterior laterally, turns at the cochlear form recess to attach onto the malleus neck. Um, and that's innervated by the fifth nerve. And so you can see this on axial image and you can see the muscle staying posteriorly. This is a cochlear for recess, the lateral course of the tensor tissue muscle to, to attach to the malleus head or neck. And that's just a arrow showing you where the tensor tympani muscle is. And there's the arrow for the pyramidal eminence in the stapedius muscle. Okay, 
we're done with the middle ear cavity. We've talked about the EAC middle ear cavity. We're going to briefly talk about the uh, inner ear now. And so there's a difference between um, the osseous labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. And so uh, the way I usually conceptualize this is um, the cochlea, the vestibule, the semicircular canals are basically holes in your head. That's what they are. Contained within, a, and this is the osseous labyrinth or bony labyrinth. So again, the cochlea contains the cochlear duct, which is a fluid filled sac. The vestibule contains the utricle and saccule, part of the membranous labyrinth, and within the semicircular canals are the semicircular ducts, part of the membranous labyrinth. So, so CT and M, CT basically, it's, 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 these structures house these fluid filled structures. So it's fluid within fluid. So you have these fluid filled sacs sitting within a fluid cavity. And um, this is the problem with imaging of the membranous labyrinth because you can basically not really image it at this point. Um, and so, uh, but realize that the cochlea, contained within a cochlea is the cochlear duct, part of the membranous labyrinth. Within the vestibule is the utricle and sacral of the membranous labyrinth within the semicircular canals or the semicircular ducts. And so here are those fluid filled sacs. And so this is the membranous labyrinth. So as I mentioned, here's the cochlear duct and that sits within the cochlea. Here's the utricle and saccul part of the membranous labyrinth, which is contained within the vestibule, the semicircular ducts, part of the membranous labyrinth contained within the semicircular canals. Okay, and this is the membranous labyrinth. So in a CT, when we talk about the cochlea then, uh, we talk about the turns of the cochlea. There are, there's a basal turn, a mid turn, an apical turn. This is called um, the turns of the cochlea and we, so you should be able to see the basal the mid and the apical turn. Uh, it makes the cochlea spirals at um, two and a half to two and three quarter turns. The central core of bone in the center of the cochlea is called the medialis. Emanating from the medialis are the spiral lamina, which forms the turns of the cochlea. And at the base of the cochlea is the cochlear aperture through which the cochlear nerve exits. So that's basically the anatomy of the cochlea, basal turn, mid turn, apical turn. Central core of bone is medialis and the spiral lamina emanate from the medialis to form the turns of the cochlea and the cochlear aperture at the base. The vestibule contains utricle and saccule. Sound waves enter at the level of the oval window. Remember to find the oval window. You follow the cochlear promontory on the medial border of coronal images to point you directly to the oval window. And so the stapes superstructure sits on the oval window. The foot plate is on the oval window itself. Sound waves enter and exit out the round window. Now the round window is located um, posterior, medial, and inferior to the oval window. Okay, anatomically, the round window is posterior, medial, and inferior. So if I go there, this is posterior, medial, and inferior. This is the round window. And notice that if you look at the basal turn of the cochlea to find it along the medial part of the basal turn posteriorly, you'll see the round window. This is the round window niche. If you look at the vestibule, at the base of the vestibule, and it's posterior, medial, and inferior to the oval window, uh, this is the round window. That's how you find the round window. And remember, the sound waves exit the round window. The semicircular canals, there are three of them, lateral, superior, and posterior semicircular canal. They're oriented uh, in 90, 90 degrees from each other. The, um, um, so this is just looking at the uh, anatomy of the cochlea. This is fluid. So one of the things about imaging of the membranous labyrinth is that you currently cannot, there are sophisticated ways that you can, uh, it, it's beyond the content of this talk, um, we can sort of image it now, but on current conventional MRI, you cannot image um, these fluid filled sacs sitting within the osseous labyrinth. So you cannot see the cochlear duct, you cannot see the utricle and saccule within the vessel because it's fluid surrounded by fluid and the membrane is so thin you can't see it at 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, or even at 7 Tesla, you can't see it um, because it's fluid on fluid with these very thin structures. Now the semicircular canals, there are three of them. There's a lateral, a posterior, and a superior semicircular canal. The lateral semicircular canal, and the canals contain the semicircular ducts, uh, part of the membranous labyrinth. The lateral semicircular canal is the only semicircular canal with its own limbs. It has an anterior and posterior limb. Both the superior and posterior semicircular canals share a common cruise, a common limb. The uh, 
posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal is shared with the medial limb of the, of the posterior semicircular canal. So it's a, a common cruise. Uh, just to show you that, and you can see that here. Um, here, the limbs of the lateral semicircular canal and this kiss sequence and does have its own separate limbs. Here's the, uh, the, the beginning of the posterior semicircular canal. Here, this is the posterior semicircular canal. It shares a common limb with the superior semicircular canal. This is a, a posterior semicircular canal. This is the common cruise. And as we go up, we can see that that becomes the superior semicircular canal. And there's a superior semicircular canal here. So this common cruise is a shared limb with the posterior semicircular canal. And as you go up higher, you can see the fluid signal intensity on the, the, the thin section T2, T2 weighted fluid sensitive sequence. And you can see it going up. So this is one of the things that you do want to see with because the, the, the osseous labyrinth is filled with fluid and the fluid within the membranous labyrinth is the endolymph, the fluid outside the membranous labyrinth and housed within the bony labyrinth is the perilymph is that you should be able to see the fluid signal intensity, which is bright on these thin section fluid sensitive sequences. So obviously if there is fibrosis within the inner ear, if there is calcification or ossification, you will have loss of the fluid signal intensity. Now on a CT, this is a CAT scan. This is going from superior to inferior. Um, the very top, this is the superior semicircular canal. You can follow that superior semicircular canal as you go inferiorly. Remember that, that Posterior semi, the posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal is shared with the posterior semicircular canal itself. So we see that. And here's the posterior semicircular canal right there and superior. And that's the common cruise. And as you go inferiorly, you can follow that. Oops. You can follow that posterior semicircular canal down. And as we go down more inferiorly, again, posterior semicircular canal, notice that the lateral semicircular canal has its own limbs anteriorly and posterior from the vestibule itself. So the lateral semicircular canal is the only semicircular canal with its own limbs. Now, these are two additional views that you may want to do. Uh, remember we talked about at the very beginning, uh, imaging axial, coronal, and sagittal plane. You can do reformatted views. Uh, this is a sagittal view reformatted along the course of the superior semicircular canal. Uh, and then if you go 90 degrees to that on a a uh, chrono oblique. Uh, these are specialized views. This is called the Pachelle view. And this is, these views are good if you're looking for uh, semi superior semicircular canal to hyssops. So notice that the Pachelle view should be aligned with the superior semicircular canal, while the Stenberg's view is 90 degrees to that. So I'm going to show you the views now. This is an example of the Pachelle view. And you can see this is aligned with the superior semicircular canal. So if you suspect a patient has superior semicircular canal to hyssens, you will see that as a loss of bone. Likewise, uh, this is the Stenvers view, which is perpendicular to the partial view. And you're, you're looking at it in, um, in, in FOSS. And so if there's a dehiscence, you can see the dehiscence, that's the superior semicircular canal. So these two views, but the partial view and the Stenvers view are additional views you can use to help you with that. Let's briefly talk about the IEC. Uh, the IEC itself, this is where the sewn and the eighth nerve enter. Um, it's triangular in appearance. The opening is called the porous acousticus. The majority of the IEC is called the body. The terminal aspect of the IEC is the fundus. It's subdivided and, and so um, very similar in, in terms of body. And then the facial canal is also called the fallopian canal. So it's sort of analogous to your uterus and the fallopian tubes in terms of naming. Uh, the Christophallus of Formis is a bony septum that separates the IC into a superior and inferior half. Um, and then there's also a cartilaginous septum that, that subdivides the superior half of the IC into an anterior and posterior compartment called Bill's bar. The facial canal sits in the IC and the anterior superior portion of the IC. And when it, it exits through the facial canal, um, so when it exits out, exits out, it immediately takes an anterior course and then turns, it turns called the, this is called the anterior genu, which is where the geniculate ganglion is. Then you, that's the first component of the intratemporal facial nerve, which is the labyrinthine segment. Uh, next segment is the tympanic segment, which travels. This is the uh, IC, this is the anterior genu. Um, this is the turn, this is the 
tympanic segment or lateral segment, it travels underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Here's a lateral semicircular canal. And then it turns 90 degrees at the posterior genu for the mastoid segment. And, and the facial nerve exits at the stylomastoid foramen. Uh, we can see that anatomy. Here's the eye. See, this is the anterior superior portion. This is where the facial nerve exits. This is, this is the labyrinthine segment. It then takes a hairpin loop. This is the anterior genu. This channel is called the facial hiatus for the greater superficial patrosal nerve. If we follow the facial canal, we're now in the tympanic segment. This is the tympanic segment. It's going to travel underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Here's the lateral semicircular canal. It's going to go underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Um, this is still the tympanic segment here, tympanic segment. And then at this point, it's now diving in fairly. This is the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. And it's, it's directly posterior to the, fa to the facial recess. This is the facial recess. Here's that hill between two valleys, sinus tippity, facial recess, vertical segment of the facial nerve. And the nerve will exit at the stylomastoid foramen as you go in fairly here. And this is going to exit out at the stylobastoid foramen. And that's just following that for that nerve to the stylomastoid foramen here. At this point, there's a stylomastoid foramen here. Uh, we can follow this anatomy on coronal images. This is going pretty far anterior. Notice that the anterior genu or labyrinthine segment is superior to the cochlea itself. Uh, this is the anterior genu. And as you go once, Kind of posterior, it has what it looks like owl's eyes. This is the labyrinthine segment proximally. This is the, the tympanic segment laterally. This is going to travel distally underneath the lateral semicircular canal as you follow this. This is going posteriorly. This is the tympanic segment. And as we go more posteriorly, there is a lateral semicircular canal. The tympanic se segment sits underneath the lateral semicircular canal. And as we go more inferiorly, at this point, it begins to dive inferiorly. And this is going to be the mastoid segment here. And to the stylomastoid frame in, inferiorly. We can play with the data sets now. We have an active chrome and a sagittal data set. So what we can do is we can do like a sagittal oblique along the course of the tympanic segment here. And this is going to be a sagittal oblique image. And then we can orient this slice along the mastoid segment. This is a double multi-planar multi a double multiplanar reformat of the facial canal. And what you get is this image, which is double multiplanar reformat image in which we can see the, the tympanic segment, the posterior genu, and the mastoid segment to the stylomastoid foramen. Great if you're looking for um, uh, expansion of the facial canal, if you're looking for bone erosion, bone destruction due to a tumor or perineal spread of tumor, for example, and you look for irregularity, deossification, expansion. So this is a nice double multiplanar reformatted view of the tympanic segment, posterior genu, mastoid segment to the stylomastoid foramen. Uh, following the facial nerve on MR, unfortunately, this text is in a way, you can actually see the nerve on a pre-contrast T1, knowing the anatomy that uh, the labyrinth, the, the uh, labyrinthine segment uh, extends from the fundus of the IC. This is the hairpin loop. Uh, this is the tympanic segment going in fairly. This is the this is the vertical or mastoid segment of the facial nerve going down to the stylomastoid foramen. That's a T1 pre-contrast T1. On post-contrast images, we can also follow the nerve Up here. This is the cochlea. We know that the labyrinthine segment should be um, superior. On contrast images, any part of the intratemporal facial nerve can enhance, uh, except for the labyrinthine segment. And the canalicular component does not enhance. So the component of the facial nerve within the IAC and the labyrinthine segment normally do not enhance. And it's considered pathological if you do see enhancement on a post-contrast image. But any other component of the facial nerve can enhance. So the, the geniculate fossa, the tympatic segment, the mastoid segment, those, those areas can enhance. So, but again, the labyrinthine segment and the canalicular segment are the two segments that should not enhance in the post-contrast image. Okay, so in summary, what we've done is I've described the anatomy for you. We talked about the technique to obtain axochrone and sagittal images of temporal bone. We also talked about um, MRI protocol for temporal bone imaging. We also went through the anatomy of the temporal bone in detail, 
going from the outside in within the EAC, middle ear cavity, inner ear, and talk about the IC and facial canal and uh, the ability to obtain multiplanar reformats of the temporal bone to help you in making, um, to evaluating pathology better. With that, I'd like to thank Dr. Wagner for inviting me to speak today. Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as always, every time I hear you, I pick up more and more of the uh, caveats of temporal bone anatomy and radiology. Listen, there's a few questions here. One person asked, um, how much radiation does a patient receive when they undergo a standard CT scan of the temporal bone? Um, it's thinner slices, but we use uh, low dose radiation. So it's the same about uh, same as a CT of the head. Okay. Um, the other question was, uh, what care should be taken in pediatric patients? Is there anything special when you're doing CT of temporal bone? Well, part of the problems with the kids is going to be um, is the, the, the technique is the same because you're going to use the submillimeter images. The problem is going to be motion is a problem with kids. Normally when we do CTs and MRs, we actually do them consecutively at our institution. We actually sedate the kids first. And then uh, the CT itself will take, you know, it's a multi-slice acquisition, will take 30 seconds. It's the MR that's going to that, that's gonna take probably about half an hour. But usually when we do a CT, we do them consecutively CT and MRI at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then is there a recommended radiation limit or does it vary with the age of the child? Um, I think people try to stay away from CT because of uh, pediatric cases and try to make the diagnosis in MR, but sometimes you really can't. You know, it's not an either or, like either do CT or MRI. It's not an either or situation, mm -hmm. especially kids who have congenital anomalies. Um, uh, you may be able to see the congenital anomalies on MR with the heavily T28 images, but things like ossicular erosions, uh, for example, uh, presence or absence of the oval round window, those structures, you can only figure that out on CT, not on MR. Sometimes, sometimes you'll have to do both. So it really depends on the clinical scenario, whether if the kid has sensory neural hearing loss or conductive or it's combined conductive through sensory neural hearing loss or it's a syndromic case. Great. Um, anybody else have any questions? Oscar, you got a question today? Oh, yes, just one question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My, actually, my question is actually uh, related to the MRI scans. And sometimes we see patients uh, with vestibular schwannoma and they uh, have a couple of different MRIs. And I was just wondering, uh, what's the, the proper way uh, of measuring those tumors? Because, you know, those are quite small. And if you measurements is not correct you can actually tell the patient that the tumor is is growing or or, or uh becoming more small so is there any rule for for measuring those tumors on mri scan uh yeah we actually standardize measurements um what i'm going to do is typically if you have a uh, for a measurement on a chrono image you would get the cranial cauda measurement but one thing you want to do is do want to standardize how you measure tumors and um I think this is from the AOS, but if you draw a line along the, the poster for the Petrus pyramid, that's going to be your axis of measurement. So the long and the short axis of the tumor, short axis is going to be the transverse measurement, the long axis is the AP measurement. This is a standardized way of measuring a tumor. So, so you draw a line basically along the, the poster part of the Petrus pyramid. And then at the level of the tumor, you're going to use that as your axis. Because this is the standardized way of measuring a tumor so that you have a short and long axis measurement. Uh, and that line of the axis is based on the poster part of the Petrus pyramid. Now, what uh, some other groups are doing these days, uh, if you have the ability to do that, is to do volumetric analysis and to take volume, you know, to measure the volume of the tumor and follow volumes as opposed to arbitrary measurements. Because obviously, if you take measurements pre caught by AP by transverse, the volume of the tumor is going to be X times Y times Z divided by two that's gonna be the, the volume of the tumor itself. You have to divide by two, and you mixture all X, Y, and Z components. Um, other people, if they're using like Vitria or their you know, uh, vital images, Vitria software or Olea, they will obtain a, a volumetric data. You'll need basically a region of interest and actually calculate volumes. 
small lesions that are very small, like they're really small, I still get three planes, but usually they're around probably one measurement is probably sufficient, like a three millimeter nodule on the superior vestibular nerve, for example. You know, it's round, it's small, um, and the volume wouldn't matter anyway in, in terms of size. So, but the best thing to do is to standard, standardize the way you measure it, because especially with reader A and reader B, two different readers are reading it and they report two different measurements, then you're gonna have to say like, how did the previous reader measure the tumor? Was it standardized? Okay. Does that answer you. your question? Is that okay, Oscar? Yeah, okay. yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, John, two more questions. One is, uh, this is from Yulika from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and he wants to know if one millimeter cuts are good enough to see the facial nerve and other temporal bone trauma in detail. Yes. One millimeter cuts, okay. Yes, one millimeter cuts are fine. Okay, and then Neela from uh, India wants to know, uh, in case of temporal bone fractures, sometimes the fracture line and the suture line look similar. How do we uh, find out if it's a fracture and confirm it? Well, you know, that's why you want to, you want to look at different planes. Um, you know, the, I talked about the petrotympanic fissure and the, which is the glycerin fissure and the tympanomastoid sutures, and those can be mistaken as fractures on a CT. When you are present, you see what appears to be a, a line and it appears to be running parallel to the, the interior posterior wall of the EAC. You know, symmetry is always very helpful when you think it's a suture versus a fracture and you look at the, the other temporal bone to see if there's a similar structure on the other side, like especially the occipital mastoid suture posteriorly gets mistaken for a fracture, for example. But I think that the petrotympanic fissure and the tympanomastoid suture tend to get mistaken for fractures a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you should be able to confirm this in three planes because you're looking at all three planes. Great. Okay, well, I think that's the end of the questions is, unless somebody else has one. Um, if not, John, listen, thank you for your, your lecture. Um, we'll post this on the, the YouTube channel. Uh, anybody has any further questions, please feel free to put it on WhatsApp and um, I'm gonna call it a day. Great, okay. Great thank you very much again, we appreciate it. You're welcome. You okay. guys have a nice day. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.